Hi, my name is Albert Stegg with the New England Backgammon Club, and I'm about to begin a session on doubling for the intermediate participants in our monthly tournaments here in the Boston area. I'm actually re-recording this introduction because I forgot to hit record at the beginning of the actual session, so I'm going to splice this onto the front, but let's begin. Off we go. Turn that cube. Winning bigger, winning faster. I always like to start with a little bit of history because I'm a backgammon history junkie. And uh, doubling and backgammon was invented in the 1920s. And it was an innovation in an ancient game. Backgammon is thousands of years old, but doubling has only been around for a little over a century. Um, here's a magazine article from Vogue, 1929, very stylish. <clears throat> and uh, the writer uh, says that backgammon as a game was a dead and discarded pastime, relegated to old men in chimney corners until the practice of doubling doubling by matches, as it's called, was injected into it and gave it a new stimulus, so much so that it has now everywhere become the rage in clubs and at house parties. And uh, here we see some backgammon matches popular at the time. And uh, this is a fun little tidbit. People ask, when was the cube invented? Uh, well, the cube was invented in 1930, but people were doubling for several years before then. It just took a few years uh, before they figured out that a cube was a great way to keep track of the doubles. So before then, they used common house matches or these fancy uh, Bakelite sticks here. Uh, but now we're happy we have the cube, and today we're going to work on turning it. Um, this innovation it, it introduced an entire new dimension of judgment to the ancient game of backgammon, providing a greater element of skill to what's Largely kind of a dice game. You know, backgammon suffers a little bit from the reputation that it's kind of all luck. We know that's not true. But if you've played much backgammon without a doubling cube, it's kind of game, 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 win, lose, win, win, lose, win. It, it's kind of static. And the doubling cube introduced a whole new level of judgment to the game that made it more fun. Uh, there's a greater variety of outcomes. Uh, even before the cube, we had gammons. They had gammons. They called a single game a hit, uh, but they still scored two or three points for gammons or, or backgammons. And they often played little mini matches of three points, uh, I guess, in their, their chimney parlors <laughs> in the dusty corners. They'd play little three game matches, cubeless. Um, the Dublin cube made for more dynamic. Uh, uh, scoring opportunities on your way to victory. And if you were to look at the score sheets of players in our open and intermediate uh, divisions at NEBC, you might notice they tell a kind of a different story. Uh, this might be an open score sheet where, where Walter wins a point and then Bill wins uh, two points because he doubled and then Walter doubles and wins a gammon. And now he's up five to two and wins another two pointer and the match is over. Um, whereas more often in the intermediate group, you might see sheets that look more like this, you know, one point at a time, one, zero, two, zero, one, two, one, three. Um, and here I, I've circled the gammons. It's my kind of habit in my own scorekeeping. Uh, and, and here Marty wins a, a gammon, but it's only worth two because he didn't get a cube in. And, uh, needless to say, these, these matches take a lot longer. And it's one of the reasons why we have shorter match lengths for the intermediates. Um, we've had some really long tournaments <laughs> early this year. And so with the introduction of clocks, we're using clocks very happily now. That speeds things up. But also using the doubling cube will make matches a little more brisk and a lot more exciting. Successful competitors at backgammon aim to win points two and four or more at a time. They're not looking to grind out one point wins on their way to victory. And I think this is a misconception that um, a lot of beginners and intermediates have that rather than risk uh, the opponent winning two or four points, they just want to knock down one point at a time. And especially if you feel like you're a stronger player than your opponent, you might think, well, 
let's let's just keep things on an even keel here. I think I can outlast him. That's not a winning strategy, and you're never going to get up to the open division with that kind of approach. And if your opponent knows anything about doubling, you're going to grind out one at a time while your opponent is winning the occasional two and four bagger and getting the better of you. So I'm going to go today for two kinds of doubling positions. Uh, we're not going to cover a lot of ground, but I'd like to cover two kind of scenarios where you should be looking to double. And the first is early attack positions. When you gain the opening advantage, let's say here you roll a 3-1, you should right away be sort of leaning in, anticipating that you might get a chance to double. You're thinking, okay, this is one of those good games. And you want to double, and you want your opponent to take. This is a really big deal, because I think a lot of time less experienced players just want to bank a point. They want to get to a point where they can just double the person will pass and they score that point and move on. That's not a winning approach. You want to try to get the cube in at a point where your opponent will take. So I'm going to go to Extreme Gammon and do a little demonstration here. So I'm going to start with this favorable. Uh, why is this waiting? 3-1, and let's say my opponent replies with a 3-4, and since we've started to make a priming structure, he's going to step up to it and come down in the outfield. This is starting to feel a little exciting, like maybe we should start thinking about doubling here, but it's still pretty early. It's very rare to get a double after the very first roll, but man, now we roll a 4-2, put him on the roof. And she replies with one six. Well, now this is looking even better. But we haven't hit our opponent yet. You know, and maybe we're thinking, well, you know, we could hit the checker and then maybe they, they come in and then I can double. You might just feel like it's not there yet. So let's say we don't double and we roll a five three. Ah, we were hoping to hit this guy. But we hit this guy instead. Now we've got them on the bar, and they fan. OK, now this feels great. right? We've got a checker on the bar. We've got all these points. We've got the back checkers moving. So now we feel good about, about it, and we double. Double. And the opponent goes, no, <laughs> and passes. So Albert, yes. would you double more there on position or on the number of points you were ahead? Oh, or I'm very glad. You mean points as in match score? Right, the number of pips that you each had. Oh, oh, the race. The race. The race. Um, I'm going to get right to that um, when I go back to the, the, the slide share. Okay, great. Um, and I'll talk about the 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 the, the salient features here. Um, but your your question actually made me think of another thing I meant to mention, and that's that uh, for the purpose of today, I'm just going to assume it's zero zero and the match score doesn't matter, right? Because okay. uh, that's a whole other topic. Once the match gets imbalanced, uh, cube action can change, but that's a whole other level of of interest. Um, so let's assume that it's just a zero zero and a long match. And let's review this. And what XG is saying here is that back here, we were correct not to double after the 3-1. But here, we missed an opportunity. In the lower left here, it's saying this is a double and a take. This was the time to double. And our opponent should take. Because after this nice sequence where we hit, and the opponent stays on the bar. Now, this is what we call losing our market. There's a market for a double. You're trying to sell a double to your opponent. And at this point, you're such an overwhelming favorite that they're like, no, happy to get out of this game uh, and, and move on to the next one. Okay. So 
So uh, to Pam's question, here are the signals that I'm suggesting that you look out for on these early action doubles. So first, that your opponent has blots around the board, that you've got blots that are available and likely to be hit. You have this guy down here, you can hit with a six, you can hit with a one. You can even hit this guy down low on your ace, although that's not really where you want to go with a five. And, and there's this guy out here. And in the in the sequence I showed, we rolled a three five and hit that guy. We could roll a four four, hit that guy. There's just a lot of blood in the water. There's a lot of there's a lot of stuff going on here. Uh, another signal would be if a, your opponent has a checker on the bar. That's even better. Uh, strong signal uh, that you might want to double. So blot vulnerability. Second, the opponent has no anchor. By an anchor, we mean the opponent owns a point with two checkers in our home board. Because if your opponent has no anchor, it means you might be able to just close them out and win a gammon. They might really not have any, you know, any further chance in the game. They might just stay on the roof forever. So no anchor. Next, the relative board strength. And by this, I just mean the home board. We've got three points in our home board. Our opponent only has one. So if there's an exchange of blots, which happens a lot in the early game, we, we have the edge on that. He's going to dance with nine any nine numbers, uh, and we don't have to roll 6-6 six, six to dance on that tiny little board, right? So superior board strength. Uh, and this is one that you'll hear uh, open level players talk about a lot, is checkers in the zone. The zone is the attack zone. And by that, we mean all the checkers in your home board. So two, four, six, seven checkers in the home board, plus any checker that bears on an empty point in your home board. So this checker on the eight point is bearing on the three or the two. And by bearing on, I mean, you can go there with one die, you know, a single die, you can go six with it. So the eight is bearing on the three or two point. If we had checkers out here on the 10 and 11, we might call that a half checker in the zone. Because if you see here on the 11 point, six away, we already own that point. We already own the four point. What we're interested in is making the three point. So a strong doubling uh, signal is to have nine or more in the zone. We start the game with only eight. Right? You have five on your six point, three on your eight point. You start with eight checkers in the zone. And here we, in this situation, we still only have eight in the zone. And that's actually somewhat of a weakness in our attack here. There's not a lot of, a lot of firepower. right? Uh, but in this case, we've got the plots available. We've got a three-point board, which is really strong. Uh, the lack of material in the zone is what gives yellow the opportunity to take here. If we had 10 in the zone, it would be a pass. And then a couple other factors that are always worth noting uh, are your back checkers split. That's a plus if they're split. It just means there are more ways to hit checkers in the outfield or you know, it just gives you more variety, make an advanced anchor of your own. And, uh, and Pam, as you pointed out, the race. Uh, so here the, the race is even. Uh, an advantage in the race is always good. But for these attacking cubes, these early attack cubes, often the race is not in your favor particularly. Okay, so these are kind of secondary things. More history. Why would you even take if you're losing, right? I mean, we've got all this power coming down on that position. Why would our opponent even want to take a, a position when they're so clearly losing? And that was a question this uh, Egyptian master who wrote Vanity Fair's book of backgammon in, in 1930 uh, felt. He said, if two absolutely perfect players engaged in a match, there would never be an accepted double. 
The author's chief objection to the double is precisely this. It's only raison d'etre, it's reason for being, is the incompetent play of those who use it. So he's a real traditionalist. He's obviously got pride. Backgammon comes from Egypt and ancient game. And he couldn't see why you would ever want to take a double as an underdog. And he wasn't the only one. There are other people who wrote books in 1930 who didn't get what's pretty widely known now, which is the 25% rule doubling concept. And the gist is, and this is going to be a little math here, but not much. I'm, I'm going to keep math to a minimum today. But it's important to understand this, that you can pass a cube and you pay a point. You lose a point. So if you take a two cube and you play on, you risk losing two points. That's one extra point than you would have lost. Right? You could lose one and play a new game. Or you can play on for two. You lose two points. That's one extra point. But you can win. And then you win two points, which is three points better than losing one, right? Instead of giving up a point, you risk losing one for a net gain of three. And here's a little illustration of that. Let's say we had a position and we agreed to play it out four times. And you said, oh, I would pass. You give me this position, I'll pass it every time. So you pass it once and you lose a point. I double you again, you pass. You, you give me a point. Third time, you pass four times in a row. You lose four points over four games. Now I go, ah, you're foolish to give up that much. I take. So I take and I lose two points. And then I lose again. I lose another two points. I lose a third game, now I'm down six but I win the fourth game and the net is minus four, right? So I only need to win one in four games in order to break even on the gamble of taking, right? And what that means is you, in, in gambler's terms, that means you enjoy three to one odds. This is a somewhat of an oversimplification in two ways. One, their gammons can come in the picture. So if you're getting gammoned a lot, you need to win more than 25% of the time. And But also if you take the cube and hold it, you might be able to redouble later. So some of those wins that you get are gonna be worth four, right? So in that sense, you need even less than 25%. And sometimes you can take with just like 21%. So owning the cube has value. But this is the idea of why you can take, you know, when you take a double, you're probably gonna lose. You're probably gonna lose. Your opponent is a favorite. You have to grant it that, but it's not worth giving them a whole point. So I wanna give you a little bit of a clue about what these XG panels are, are telling you. So here's this uh, position after 3-1 when we decided not to double and XG agreed. We're on roll. Right? Everybody. This number here at, at no double, this is the fair settlement value. Let's say we were playing a money game. We're playing for a dollar a point. And we'd been playing for a while and the score was even. And I got to this position and you got a telephone call and it's your spouse saying you have to go pick up the kids and you have to do it now. And so you say, oh, sorry, I can't finish. I've got to go. Well, I go, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. I. I've got a winning position here. This isn't an even game. You owe me something. Well, this is what you owe me. 0.36. At a dollar a point, that's 36 cents. This game is worth 0.361 of the cube value. And here you would decrease your equity by doubling. If you give away the cube, XG is saying that your, your equity drops to 19 cents instead of 36. It's only worth 19 because you gave away the cube too early. And this is the cost of doing that. You lost almost 17 cents. On the other hand, uh, and, and XG is telling you that the result here is you shouldn't double. Okay. And here we are a roll later. 
And here's where XG is saying we should double. We start with a fair settlement value of 66 cents, and we can increase it to 73 by doubling. So backgammon, you're always trying to move to a higher equity state, whether it's checker plays or, uh, or cube action. And so here, if you don't double, it's costing you equity. You're leaving money on the table by not doubling. And what's also neat is when you double, your opponent might pass. This is a scary position. And any of you might pass this as, ye as yellow? <laughs> I'd think about it. <laughs> I think it's it's kind of a scary cube. If your opponent passes, she gives you a whole point. That's a, a whole dollar when the position was only worth 73 cents. So your opponent's just giving you 0.266. So you give your opponent an opportunity to blunder when you double, right? So it pays to be aggressive in your thinking with cubes. Your opponent, even if your double is wrong, sometime your opponent will make a bigger blunder by uh, by passing. Everybody with me? <laughs> a bunch of muted mics out there. Yep. We're here. We're here. Yep. I'm <laughs> here. Good. I'm relying on Troy. Troy is smiling a lot, and it, it really helps. <laughs> this is very good. <laughs> Back to XG. And I, I'm going to try something with you that we call deliberate practice. And that is, I'm going to set up this position which XG, and we agreed, is not quite a double yet. And we're just going to play from this position over and over. And we're just going to see how the dice go and see whether doubling opportunities arise. Um, so again, these doubling signs, you know, I gave you a bunch of stuff there. The big ones we're looking for, your opponent has no anchor. You have superior homeboard strength. And one extra point is good. Two extra points is great. And we want to look at how many checkers we have in the zone, where nine is good and 10 is great. And here I'm just sharing this card. This is just instructions on how to set up deliberate practice in Extreme Gammon. And um, I'll talk a little bit about Extreme Gammon later in the game. It's, it's the, the essential tool if you really want to work on your game, it's a good bargain uh, that these instructions will tell you how to set that up. I don't need to go through these. It would be boring. Uh, and this is more of that. We're going to have the cube panel active. We're going to be on roll. We're going to have the cube centered. We're, we're going to assign a, a robot to play against us at, at an expert level. And there are different modes you can look at. And we're going to make use of a coaching mode that will critique our, our play. So before each roll, we're going to weigh our, our cube decision. We're going to take care with checker play. We're going to try to play the checkers right, but let's not get lost in the weeds. We're thinking about doubling today, so I'm not really going to answer questions about checker play. And we're going to play until either the opponent anchors or escapes his checkers or turns the game around, and we're not in a position to double anymore. And another thing I've, I've learned is that on a Mac anyway, when I'm doing a screen share, you're not able to see the little, you're able to see these menus, but you don't get to see the panels that I pull up. But I've got the position here set up. I've got it copied in my clipboard. I'm gonna play from the position. I'm gonna set the top player to a expert robot. And I'm on roll and I'm gonna click six, five, it's not the attacking role I wanted, but it races. Why is my, okay, my computer is having to think of it. Now at this point he anchored. It's like, well, that's not interesting for us. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna paste the uh, position back in. And I'm just gonna try again. Ah, this time I come down and I can attack him. Uh-oh, he hit me back. I'm going to press the attack here. I'm going to come in low and I'm going to hit him with the spare. I've still got the stronger board. Okay. 
Okay, he got the better of me again. Oof, I can come in. I'm going to do it. One five. Okay, so this has kind of gotten out of control. We're not in attack game anymore. I've got five checkers back. This is not going to be a, an early uh, attack cube. So again, we'll drag in the position. All right, I'm hitting in the outfield. All right, do we want to think about this? Anybody want to unmute? And uh, what about our signals? Which of our signals are active? You have two points. Yep, better than his one, right? You don't have the nine. Right. He what? You don't have the nine in our home board. You only have eight in the zone. Oh, right. Eight in the zone is very thin, very thin. He's got one extra point, eight in the zone. Mm. You know, we're up in the race for sure, but this is a little too thin to, to, to send a cube here, I think. Nobody's got an anchor. Yeah, no anchor. That is good. That's promising. Well, you know, we're hoping to hit him with maybe a two or a three, and then he's going to miss us. Let's see what happens. Well, you know, six, we can come down, we could take that point, or we can press our attack. I'm in the mood to press our attack because we have a stronger board and because I'm teaching a game on doubling. Okay, he got the anchor. Rats. Okay, well, let's see if we were right about that decision. So um, down here in the bottom, I'm in competition mode, which is where I, I like to play without help. And if I click on that and go to, say, teaching mode, it'll show you that it didn't like that 6-3 play. <laughs> but it's certainly... Uh, Okay, so it said no double, but is that much of a margin there? No. It's a penny. It costs a penny to double. You can certainly send that cube. And if I plus, 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 it's going to evaluate on a somewhat higher level of, of analysis. It's somewhat big. It's like four cents. It costs you four cents to double. Yeah, all right. So, you know, it wasn't much in that either way. Let's try it a couple more times. So Albert, with all things being equal, you're giving up control of the cube. Is that, would that factor into your thinking? Um, it's kind of baked in. It's baked into the, it's certainly baked into XG's numbers that it's giving you. Yep. Um, but if I'm a, a solid favorite and I've got gammon threats, it's like, well, yeah, that's, that's part of his privilege. He gets to own the cube. And that's a good question. To go back to the sport metaphor, to help understand the value of cube ownership, you know, in a football game, you know, to get a touchdown, you have to reach the end zone. But if three points will help you, you can kick a field goal. <laughs> so backgammon cube ownership is kind of like there's there's a very small amount of time left. And to win, I have to get a touchdown. But if you own the cube, all you have to do is make a field goal. Because if you get within the 25-yard line, that 25%, you can double me and make it painful, or I might have to pass. You don't actually have to get to the end zone. You get to 80%, and I'll have to just give up. But since you own the cube, I have to go all the way to 100%. You get to fight on till the very last breath. Um, Let's try this one more time. And for those watching this video, this is me a day later cheating a little bit. I decided I wanted to add a few more rounds of this deliberate practice uh, in the hopes of getting a few more interesting illustrative examples into the video. So here we go with our position. Oh, and we get the big 6-6. Six, six. All right, this should certainly put us in a strong doubling position, we hope. Let's see if he anchors up. does not anchor up. So let's consider our doubling signals here. First, our opponent is vulnerable with no anchor in our home board and blots vulnerable to attack. And this checker in particular is on a point where we would love to uh, hit him and then challenge him to hit back, or we can just roll this forward and perhaps close them out. 
we have two, four, six, eight, ten checkers in the zone. And recall that that's pretty darn good, right? Eight is what we start with. Nine is good. Ten is great for the attack. Uh, in uh, side issues, you know, we've we've said that it's nice to have your back checkers split. But we've actually got all the way up here with an advanced anchor. And with the six, six, we have a big doubling lead. So there should really be no doubt that we're going to send this cube. Double take. And our opponent is taking uh, in the hopes that uh, that she'll get an anchor on this four point. Four, three, let's go ahead and press the attack. We're going to play for a gammon here and see if we can achieve it. Well, our opponent anchored. So we're not going to get the close out, but we're in an awfully strong position. And now our opponent has you know, a fairly difficult game to play. And we're just going to stop here because the game is sort of settled down, right? We're not going to blitz them to the point of a closeout, but we're in a very strong position and we're very happy we doubled. Uh, so let's just check on what XG thought about our cube decision. And there it is, double take, uh, a big 0.108 uh, doubling uh, incentive there, right? We'd be, we'd be giving up a lot by not turning the cube here. Uh, but our opponent can see wins still over 30% of games, so has a very comfortable take. Let's try again. And the 6-3, this is a good attacking number. It uh, hits on that point we're aiming at and brings down a, a checker into the attack zone. Our opponent hits back, but kind of has to waste a nice pair of double ones. Would have liked to make the five point, I'm sure. Let's continue the attack here. We have the stronger board. See if we can get away with it without getting hit once. And here we go. We should certainly look at it anyway, right? Let's go through our signals. Our opponent is vulnerable, lacks an anchor, and has three vulnerable blots. That's good for doubling. The blots aren't really where we'd like them to be to attack. We'd much rather attack a checker down on our bar point so we could bring more material into the zone or, or attack them on a point that we're eager to make right away. And the problem is these checkers are a little bit deep in our board, especially because we only have two, four, six, eight checkers in the zone, which is very thin. We do have one extra point in our board compared to our opponent. No, but we've been hit once, so we have this extra checker all the way back, which means our race must be pretty bad. So this might be a little tempting. Good things could happen, but it's just not there yet. Uh, you know, maybe if we had an opponent on the bar already, uh, that would be a good argument. But right now, we're sometimes we call this we're threatening to threaten. And I think we should take a role here. But it's certainly right to think about it. All right, we missed this one. And there's no real way to attack these low points. You know, we could, if we really wanted to go all out, do this, but this is the wrong idea with only eight in the zone. We really want to build up our, our attacking power before we go all out. And there's a very productive 3-3 three, three we can make. And uh, we could just bring another checker down. Now we've got two, four, six, eight, ten in the zone. And boy, our opponent had better roll something good here. Oh, hits. Okay, that was disappointing. Now we're back on our heels. We still have the stronger board, but it's uh it's gonna be unusual to want to double from the bar, especially when we have four back. Oh. But we come in, we make a strong point, and we can hit. Uh, this is partly a tempo hit just to prevent our opponent from doing anything. And uh, uh, with a dance here, we'll have a monster double, I think. There's the dance. Let's look at our signals. This is pretty different from our, our original type positions. But what have we got? Uh, opponent has no anchor. And we have a four-point board compared to one. That's huge. We've got additional vulnerable checkers. 
Uh, we do have four checkers back, a long ways to go, but I think we're going to, you know, clearly we can we can double this and let our opponent worry about the take, but it's probably going to be just way too gammonish for our opponent to double drop, except it to be and sure enough, um, we got the pass. So it didn't like our 5-5 five, five play, but our doubling decisions, for the role, yeah, we, we talked about a double here, and we can see that that would have been a, a really big a big mistake, a big blunder to offer the cube for the reasons we we recognized. Just not all right, six three. Here's a, a nice hitting opportunity, attacking the checker that we on a point we want to make. This is very good for an attacking cube if we can get away with it. Ooh, and we got away with it. Our opponent has danced on the bar, and now let's check our signals. So our opponent is on the bar already. It's a strong doubling sign with these two other blots vulnerable because our opponent lacks an anchor. So we have closeout potential. We do have a stronger board, two points to his one. And we have a fair chance of making a third point right away. Two, four, six, eight, nine checkers in the zone is good. 10 is better, but nine is plenty good for this kind of a cube. And I think we're gonna Send it. Double take. Three, two. All right, let's let's play this for a few rolls and just see how it develops. We'll see if we can roll this forward and win a gammon. So this is interesting. We could just play uh, tight with the nine point, make this uh, kind of priming play, but that's not why we doubled. We doubled to try to win a gammon, and we can pick up two checkers here and make it very hard for our opponent to anchor. Let's do it. 6-2. Well, we could hit this one loose. This is starting to get a little bit, <clears throat> a little bit ahead of ourselves, leaving two blots, making our opponent a favorite to hit it. Why don't we just scoop up an extra checker? And then if the closeout works, it works, or else we can prime these checkers down, down low. Our opponent did get lucky and came in with both, which is disappointing, but let's play this until, uh, until we see our opponent anchor, just to see if we can continue this, this attack. And uh, let's keep things open a little bit here. Okay, no anchor. One, oh ho. One, even though we got hit, we came back with this joker. Let's hit and make another point. And with our final five, ah, let's just tighten up here a little bit. We'll go after this blot. Dance, hit. Now we want to hit this loose, even if we don't have anything to cover with. Dance again, <clears throat> beautiful. Dance. <clears throat> and when we're we're pursuing a blitz here, we're we're not worrying about these back checkers. You know, our opponent could roll a 2-2 a two -two joker or something, but if that happens, we'll we'll just tip our cap. Let's bring two down. It gives us two indirects with a, a ton of covers. Okay. Let's keep moving forward. Okay. Our opponent has anchored and he has a two-point game, but we're in, in gorgeous position here. We had a great opportunity to, to push this all the way to a closeout, which we, we did our best. It didn't quite pan out, but this is looking pretty darn good, and we are certainly happy that we doubled. So let's take a look. Let's see what XG thought about our, our cube. Double take and double take. Uh, our opponent you know, still has a very strong chance of anchoring and look, wins about 33% of the games, which is, is plenty more than 25, but look at the, the gammon cost. We win a big 28% gammons here, which is why it's such a strong double that our opponent can nevertheless take. All right, let's move on to the other one. <laughs> All right, so that was the early game scenario. And now I wanna jump all the way to the end to, to pure racing positions. 
And here's just an example of a sort of an artificial racing position where both players have 100 pips to go. And it's going to be a pure dice game, pretty much. So once we call contact is broken, when players can't hit each other anymore, it's doubling is just purely mechanical. And there's a tiny bit of contact here on this, on the, on the midpoints, right? This is the only point of contact. The chance of either playing having to leave a blot is, is negligible. For all, all purposes, this is really a pure race position. And again, remember, in these positions, you want to double while your opponent still has a take. You don't want to just win one point in these. You want to win two. OK. Being on a roll makes you a favorite, but not a doubling favorite. Here it shows us we're, by virtue of being on roll, we're, we're winning 58% of the time. And doubling would be a big blunder. How about if we move a checker back from a 22 to the 12, 10 pips? How will that change things? Now we're up 10 pips. We have 100 pips to go. And that means we have a 10% lead. And XG likes doubling here. Right? See, we've got 75%. Our opponent's got just under 25%, right? So the double here is, is good. It's very solid. It's not huge. It's worth six cents on the dollar. So if you're down by 10%, you would take? Uh, by and, and this is hard on, on talking about the race. <laughs> when we say we're down in the race, Colloquially, we say, oh, I'm down in the race, 10 pips. That means we're trailing by 10, right. which means our pip count is higher. Right? Here, you see at the bottom here where it says pip equals 100? Right. Our opponent is 110. Yep. We're, we have the smaller pip count. So that means we're winning. And we say we're up in the race. Are, you, are we winning? Yeah, we're up. We're up in the race. But that means we're, we have a smaller pip count. And that can, can be a little confusing, right? But just remember, you know, the smaller your pip count, the, the shorter distance you have to go. It's like you're running a, a race, right? If you're winning the race, you have a shorter distance to go, right? right. I'm but up 10 yards, right? If it was reversed mm -hmm. and we were up by 10 points, 10%, is that a reason to take? Is it close enough that, that we would take the double if the um, position was reversed? Yes, this is, um, this is exactly what I'm getting to. Yes, you can take a uh, position. And what this XG is telling us here is that here, our opponent, you can see our opponent is trailing by 10 pips, by 10%. And yet they have a take, an easy take. How far, how much can you be trailing and still take? Excellent question. <laughs> We're getting right to that. So let's see what happens if we increase this lead by one pip at a time. So uh, out here on the board, I'm just going to move this checker back one pip at a time. And let's see how that affects the doubling decision. Okay. okay. You with me? Right. So here we are. We're, we're, 10 pips ahead, 10% of 100. Now we took the checker back one. Now we're up 11 pips with an 11% lead. Of, of course, our double is even stronger, but our opponent can still take, right? It's up in the 91% now, nearly 92, but it's still a take. Move it back one more pip, 12%. Ooh, it's really close now, <laughs> 0.98. It's you know just a small mistake to pass this. Two cents on the dollar, right? Big, big double, right? The closer it is to a take, the more important it is to double, right? Uh, and notice our opponent all the way down at 22%, right? And that 
extra, remember we said you need 25. You can take with 22% here because there's a lot of race to go. And if you turn it around, you'll be able to double back to four. So some of those 22% wins are going to be worth four points. You know, uh, some of our wins will also be worth four points, but more of theirs, right? So that's why it's it's lower. So that's 12%. And here we are at 13. Pass. Did that answer your question, Pam? Yes, thank you. Right, it's a very narrow window. And I'm going to represent that here with the 8, 9, 12 rule for racing doubles, okay? So this is a little timeline at, at the left side of an even race. Clearly, you're not going to double. And you're not going to have a double until you get to a point where you're 8% up for an initial double. If you already own the cube, you, you need even a little more. You want to wait till you're 9%. Now, this is getting very fine-tuned, right? And if you're not already pip counting and things, you're, you're not going to be able to be this precise. But in theory, that's just good to remember that, you know, cube ownership is so valuable that you need to be even a little farther ahead to offer that recube, right? 12% is the point of last take. And beyond that, your opponent should pass. Pass with a 12% deficit. Or another way, and this, this works very, very well. Most um, open players use this, 10% plus two pips, right? Which if it's a 100 pip race, 2% is, is two pips. But it's uh, it turns out that that's a very reliable way. And 10% is such an easy number, right? If you can count the race, it's very easy to get 10%. You just move the decimal over and round it. So 10% plus two pips is the point of last take. And, you know, if you're online playing and they display the pip count, then, you know, it's great. You can, you know, you can see it right there and quite easily figure 10%. Uh, and if you want to learn pip counting, you know, it takes some effort. There's a lot of stuff at Backgammon that you'll just pick up by playing and copying the, the other players you see. Uh, and your opponent, learning from your opponent. But Pip County, it's, it, it is work. You have to devote yourself to doing it. And there are a lot of methods. There's cluster counting and half crossover counting, colorless counting, which I find to be confusing. <laughs> I use shift counting, which is a, a visual method where you just figure out the difference. I find usually if I get the difference, that's enough. Um, but then if I'm not sure, then I count the leader. And Google is your friend here. You can Google Pip counting and and see all sorts of articles and videos about it. Or we can talk about it on ABC if you want to grab me sometime in that learning hour before, before play starts. Um, but I thought for today, you know, it, I always think it's kind of mean when, when expert players just get so, so, well, you should learn how to pip count. You know, I did it. And, you know, the fact is that a lot of people just aren't going to go to that. You know, you're not that crazy about the math part of the game, it, it's work. So maybe we can still just eyeball things and see how well we can do just kind of looking at a position. So let's have a look at this. Here's just a, a racing position. You know, compared to that last one, you know, does this feel like a 10% lead? You know, try to maybe see which checkers kind of line up. And, uh, you know, like there are these three checkers and there are these three checkers, right? And this, this brown is behind a couple. Well, this guy is pretty far behind. There's no brown checker over here, right? So this checker has a ways to go. And this guy is up a little bit. These guys are pretty much the same. What do you think? I think... I think it is a lead. Enough, 10%? It's 10%. Right? Yeah, so this is a double take. It's in that window. So just seeing this one checker is lagging by quite a bit. Let's see in the ballpark. Here's the flip side. Here's our opponent. Oh, shoot. Oh, yeah, I gave the pip count away here. <laughs> you can see it up there. It's 14, right? So in this one, uh, yeah, this 
Can you just look at this and see that it looks pretty bad? <laughs> so there are two yeah. checkers here. There's two there plus this one. Only two checkers here. We got three here. So we've got this checker and one more that need to go pretty far. And this is this is too big a, a deficit. So we're going to go back to XG. Doubling by feel. Let's see. If we're up around 10%, we can double. We'll just say around 10%. And if doubled, are we worse than 12%? We're going to pass. We'll do our best. And, you know, when you get it wrong, that's part of, you know, getting better at it, right? It's, it's kind of uh, learning by doing. Here we go. All right. And here we might actually have a little bonus um, just talking about bearing and checkers. Um, when you're bearing in for a race, what you're really aiming to do is to bring all of your checkers into these three points. You want these checkers to be kind of nice and, and uh, robust. You don't need to be putting checkers down on the low points, right? We don't need checkers here. And we'd, we'd kind of like the checkers to be in, in a, you know, heavy on the six, somewhat lighter on the five, somewhat lighter on the four, this kind of triangular pattern. All right, we're going to play from position. Albert? Yes? What is the benefit of the triangle position? Oh, it's a matter of uh, efficiency. So um, when you roll a six and you take a checker off the six point, you get full value of that six you rolled, right? When yes. your opponent has no checkers on the six and five, and let's say all their checkers on the four point and lower, when they roll a six, they're happy because they take a checker off the four point, but they don't get the full value. It's like, it's like they rolled a four. So when your checkers aren't efficiently placed, it's almost like they might as well have taken the six and five off your dice and replaced them with fours, <laughs> right? Because you can't roll those high numbers. They don't benefit you anymore. Um, yeah, so having sense. them in that triangular position turns out to be the optimal way to keep checkers flowing in a way that's efficient. Because when the three or two or one point are empty, the checkers will kind of tumble down from that high six point into the gaps. Mm. And it's you can liken it if you uh, picture a wave breaking on the shore. It, there's a mathematical relationship to that, the kind of the way that things topple over and roll forward. Uh, it's kind of a waveform. And that's kind of a neat topic on its own. Cool. Thank you. It is cool. <laughs> I didn't come up with that, by the way. It's <laughs> I learned from the Giants. Can you play from position? All right, we start with a poor number. And we're starting out, um, by the way, this is 120 pip position. So it's a little longer than that first one we did. But it, you know, generally when you have checkers on the midpoint still, it's going to be sort of a 100 plus race. So, you know, 10% would be about 12 pips. Okay. Generally, if you can bring checkers into your home board, you want to do it. Uh-oh. They gained on that. Uh, all right. Uh-huh. I don't think we're winning yet. They rolled that 6-5. Kind of see what this checker is a little ahead, but these checkers are behind. He's got more down here. Oh, baby. Well, I rolled 20, he rolled 10. What are you feeling? Is it soup yet? Um, it could be. You want to do a, a little math here? So, it almost seems like it's almost too good. Right. It can't be too good. Uh, so too good to double means you hope to win a gammon. There's no way that you can win a gammon here. Right? Oh, okay. Yeah, but you're feeling like it's so good. So these two checkers 
would go here and here. That's 10 pips right there, right? And we're down under 100 now. This could be close. What do you think? You want me to double or not? Double. Yeah, double. All right. Sure. Let's double. We double. Double. Take. Now we got a problem here. This this gap on the four is we, we never really had an opportunity to stick a checker in there. And now every time we roll a four, we're not going to be able to take a checker off and it'll never fill up with itself. But five, five will cure a lot of things. <laughs> if you can take a checker off, you should just do it. Oops. I think we got this one one. Okay. Well, we played like world champs, so probably our cube was right. Oh, there we go. Um, double take, right? Uh, it was a tiny double. It was a just a two penny double, right? But we got it right. Let's try it again. Good job, guys. <laughs> All right, off we go. Three one. Can we roll that last time? Five. Let's bring it in. Bring it down. How are we doing here? Not so good. Right. So here I want to just illustrate this shift method that I was talking about. Let me grab my little little pen here. By the shift method, you try to cancel out checkers that look the same. So these two are the same, right? And look. These checkers are the same, right? There's no advantage there for either player, right? And these are the same. Now, how about these and these? They're kind of the same. They're, On they're, average. They're exactly the same, right? Yeah. Right? Eight times three is the same as seven plus eight plus nine. So you can just sort of visually slide these checkers, right, symmetrically back together and they form the same stack. You move this up and you move this one back, right? So you slide those together. And the only difference here is this last checker, right? This checker should be here. We're down by how much? Seven. Seven. We're seven pips down in the race. So we do not want to double, all right? Now, having done that work, let's do something else that's that's clever. We're just going to keep a running count. We're down seven. Now, what are we? We rolled three. We were down seven. We rolled three. So we're down four. Down four. We were down four. He rolled nine. We're down 13. Down 13. Um, did I count the four? I forgot. <laughs> nine. Uh, We're down nine. Down nine. Are we back to nine? Yes. Okay. Double. Oops. Oh, he doubled. All right. So we're down nine. And, you know, we could talk about pip counting this. We would want to count yellow's uh, position here. But does it feel like nine is worse than 12%? Here. I mean, either side could get lucky rolls. Right, but we're going to try to apply our knowledge here. And, you know, he's got nine pips on us here. So, in other words, if it were 10%, he'd have a pip count of 90. Remember that that first one we looked at was 100? Is no, this a lot more advanced? Looks, less. Hmm? looks like less. Looks like less. Without knowing the exact pip count, how do we know 10 or 12 percent? Right. Yeah, so I'm trying to see if, if we can sort of build a, an intuitive sense of, of how long a race, like whether this is a position where nine pips feels like a lot, right? I'm going to say that in this position where we still have checkers on the midpoint, nine, nine pips doesn't feel like a lot to me. But let's let's go ahead and count yellow. 
And let's do, do this by a, a cluster right here. Uh, just to give you a, a little sense of how we might go about this. Um, I like fives. <laughs> my timetables, fives were always my favorite. <laughs> so I get nine times five is 45, 45. 45. And then we have two more sixes here, 45, 51, 57. Ooh, and there's a three, that's 60, 67, 67 plus these two 13s here, 67, 77, 87 plus the six, 93. Ooh, nine, nine on 93. Sounds like 10%, right? Ooh. Yeah. So it seems like it's a take. Take, yeah. Take. Now we got to get on our horse. Yeah. Ah. Oh. Ouch. All right. We do want to get another checker on that four point, I think. Oh, that's bad. All right, we lose. No, but we played like the world champ, so it looks like the cube is right. Yep. Very easy take. Very easy. When you play the world champ, you lose. <laughs> that's right. With regard to racing. So yeah, they had nine pips on a on a race of uh of uh, 93, right? So that was 10%, right? And that's very reliable, um, that, that count for these kind of long races. And we can get into things about wastage. If there are a bunch of checkers piled up on the low points, um, that rule can, you need to modify it, but we're not gonna address that today. Um, okay, I think that's, that's enough for that. Um, I think just remembering that 10%, metric that 10 percent is kind of where the action is when you're talking about these racing cubes and it's an easy number to to figure out if you can do a count but i also think if you just can develop that that shift counting approach um then you can um often just intuit it and honestly there's just you know outside of just telling you to learn to pip count there's nothing much more i can do for you <laughs> um one other thing I'll just, another little just reference thing. Is just to mention that this is a, a handy little factoid. If you have all of your points filled with two checkers, that's 42 pips. You can see that down here in the lower right. That's just a very handy number to know, 42. And then if you put the last three up there, that brings it up to 57. So this is like a you know 60 pip race with all of the checkers home and kind of top heavy slightly, right? And that contrasts to where you have checkers you know still on the midpoint, which is often going to be you know more like a you know this is more like a hundred pip race. Oops, something like you know thereabouts, right? So um, if you do play online where they um display the pip count, you know, you can start paying attention and play a little game with yourself. If you play on Galaxy or something, it, when you're doing the race, try to just look at the position and guess, just take a guess. Oh, I think this is 110 pips. And then look and then see and if you're high or low. And you will get better at that, just sort of eyeballing it and getting a, a sense of, of the race length. And then you get a secondary sense of, well, is 15 a lot? It's like, yeah, 15 is usually a lot. Um, eight is usually not a lot if there are checkers to, to bring home. Okay. Um, this is just a little um, graphic of kind of what's going on with the cube. The cube is like a tug of war where right in the middle, when you begin a game where no neither player has rolled yet, either player might get the opening roll. The equity is zero. Right, the fair settlement value is zero. You just don't play, right? 
And then it's a tug of war. You either go to the left where your opponent is a favorite or you go to the right where you're a favorite. And a good cube increases your equity, moves you toward uh, the 1.0 of equity. 1.0 is just winning a single game. If you win a gamut, it's 2.0. Well, the bad cube will, will pull your equity in the other direction. And once in a while, you just roll a joker that's so wonderful, you jump all the way from no double to double pass. And that's called losing your market. And you know, you're know you happy to have rolled well, but you always feel a little bit regretful um, that you didn't get the cube in before you did that. And maybe you should have. Uh, so always be approaching a double or anticipate that you might get doubled. Be sensitive to your opponent's vulnerability and discomfort. Yeah. You know, are they starting to squirm over there? Are they starting to get irritated? Would you like to be doubled in that position over there? Instead of thinking about how they might turn things around, you know, be optimistic and go, oh, you know, I could just blow them away here. This could go very well for me and make them pay for the chance to turn things around. And how much decisive might the immediate exchange be? Am I going to roll something? Am I pretty likely to roll something that's going to make me dominant in this game? Am I going to lose my market? So double when your advantage threatens to become overwhelming. And that's what that happens in the race. When you're 10% up, you know, if you roll better than your opponent, you're going to lose your market when you're already up 10%. You know, maybe they'll roll better and it'll be back to about 50. But you know, you, you had your chance. And you have to accept that sometimes uh, the game will go badly. You're going to lose. Or you're probably going to win. And you want to win for twice as much. But they're going to win like a third of the time or a quarter of the time. That's backgammon. Um, this is just kind of a taste of backgammon uh, doubling. There's a lot of ways to go about doubling knowledge. So there are reference positions. and Expert players, we just know a lot of positions. We know, oh, this is a double take because I know this position. And the position I'm looking at over the board is similar to that in some important ways. It's actually a little stronger than that. So I'm sure that it's a double and it might be a pass. Um, so you accumulate these, uh, these reference uh, positions that show up in various books that you can, can check out. Sometimes there's brute force calculation and very few circumstances. Uh, at the end of a game, you can figure out my opponent here. Um, yellow's on roll. And they double you. Well, if you can find nine rolls in 36 that fail, then you can take. Uh, we're not going to cover that so much. There are rules of thumb. There's O'Hagan's Law about market losing sequences that gets a little more particular. There are formulas like the one I gave you just now. Uh, there are more sophisticated racing formulas that take into account wastage checkers on those low points. Uh, and there are these game plan heuristics. You might have heard of position, race, and threat. Uh, Mark Olson's masterclass book has his way of evaluating um, cube decisions based on whether you have an advantage in one or more game plans, like priming and attacking. Um, so that's Pratt at the bottom. Better position, better race, substantial threats. If you have two of the three, you can double. If you have all three, the your opponent should pass. And that's very simple, and it's not that easy to apply very accurately, but it, it gives you something to think about. Um, I'm not expecting you to pick that up from right here. I'm just kind of giving you a sense of what's out there, which is a lot. And then just experienced players, you just develop a feel. Now, if you play a lot of backgammon, you get used to people doubling you at certain times that make you discomfortable. And um, you start to develop an instinct of when it's right to cube. Another invention of the 30s, the Chouette. This is an illustration, again, from uh, a magazine. Actually, this is a uh, Bonwit Teller advertisement, I think. Um, in a Chouette, you have three to five players play at a single table. Uh, one player plays alone against the captain. And then whoever wins plays alone and the loser goes to the end of the line and you keep score. Everybody has their own score and it's really fun. And you get to see a lot of different decision-making and have arguments 
and persuasions and, and reasons for doing things. And um, you'll often see, uh, you, you often see open players. Uh, here's a seven handed chouette that uh, we used to have in Harvard Square before this bar closed during COVID and never reopened. <laughs> Um, but we still play Chouettes in, in Davis Square, um, Alex and, and Matt and, and a couple others. Um, and actually, we were thinking that it might be fun some non-tournament Sunday to have an open house where everybody can come and we play Chouettes. We get groups of, of four at a table and play for a very small stake, like 25 cents uh, a point. And uh, it's a very sociable, very fun way of playing. And it's also a thing you can do between matches, like on those tournament days when you're in the consolation and you've got to wait for three matches, like you play a chouette and the time just flies by. So um, any of you might be interested in that? If you think? we're interested in that. Yeah. Yes. I, I've never done one. Yeah. I would be interested. In that. Good, good. We might actually do that fairly soon because I, I, I like that we're getting... You know, our attendance is great lately, and I kind of want to really motivate people to be playing in between tournaments. So look out for a notice about that. This extreme gammon software that I've been using here for the deliberate practice and analysis, it's really, really powerful. It's only $60. And this is really something that any serious open player would, would pay hundreds of dollars for the software. It's so valuable. And it's it's just a one-time purchase. It's not one of these subscription things. You buy it and you own it. And um, it may not be available forever. The word's kind of got out that the owner has expressed interest in selling it. And he's looking for someone to buy it. And you just never know at that point whether it's going to disappear or whether someone's going to buy it and charge $200 for it or whether they're going to buy it and roll it into something else. So if you're at all interested or think you might be, I'd really encourage you to Google Extreme Gammon and just buy it and download it and have it. Uh, I use a Mac and it works on a Mac if you also use an emulator program. A free version on the um, iPad. If I were to upgrade, do you think it would have the same capability or is it strictly- The desktop version is distinct from the iPad or, or op phone version. You can do, you can't really do that. Um, I'm not sure you can play from a position the way you, I did today. And there are just a lot of features that aren't available and the engine is not as strong. So what is this aggr aggregator or something that you have for a Mac? So there's no Mac native version of XG, but you get this program called Crossover, which you also have to pay for, unfortunately. Um, and you can run it. It works quite, quite well. You might have to get a little help setting it up. Hmm. So the more you know, the better it gets. There's all sorts of ways to learn online. There are online forums and there are books. If you go to the NEBC website, there's a whole section on books and they give little blurbs on, on um, you know, the contents of them. Tons of books being written these days or our tournaments. And there are a big tournament coming up, the Boston uh, Open that Ross Gordon runs in February. And uh, I'm gonna send out an email about, about that event because I think uh, it'll have a lot of, to offer uh intermediates and open alike um there are a ton of backgammon videos on online there's a ton of people giving lessons online these days doing demonstrations uh, you know the the quality will va vary your mileage will vary uh because it doesn't uh you don't have to be certified to you know to uh to make backgammon videos but there's a ton of them out there and uh, match commentaries and things can be a lot of fun uh, and there are lessons. And um, I know Marty gives lessons. He's part of a group called the Backgammon Learning Center. Um, there's a nice picture of uh, old days at Frank's. He was doing a lesson, I think, on Dublin back then. Um, and uh, there's a lot of people out there. I give lessons. Um, and this is my contact info. Uh, I'm not putting my phone number up here because this is going to go online. But <laughs> if you ever need to email me, you can just ask questions. Um, that's my email or anything that you send to NEBC goes to me anyway. So you don't really need this. You can just um, contact me or if you want to get in touch with Marty or Alex, um, send me you know a message and I'll pass it along to them. I don't give out other people's addresses, but I'm happy to pass things along. All right. I think that 
is it. <laughs> you know, this is me. Lessons, events, parties, chouettes. I'm I'm up for any kind of backgammon, <laughs> uh, especially up here on, on Cape Ann, on the North Shore. Uh, so I think that uh, concludes. Terrific. Thank you so much. And great. Thank you, Albert. Well, you're welcome. So anyway, I'll, I'll be posting this online for those who weren't able to make it tonight. Thank you, Albert. That is. Thank okay. you, Albert. Really you're welcome. Nighty-night. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let's try one more.